Right, we're going to get started as people keep coming in. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. So today we're looking at a guide to personal digital archiving, archival pers preservation and digital collection management. My name is Jennifer Haddo. I'm the outreach assistant at the Zorian Institute. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time joining us for one of our webinars, the Zorian Institute is a nonprofit organization that serves scholarship and public awareness by supporting scholars and academics in comparative and multidisciplinary research on the issues of genocide, human rights, and diaspora homeland relations. The Institute also houses a large quantity of reference and archival material to support these scholars, as well as writers and non-governmental organizations, journalists, and even filmmakers. So one of the Institute's formative initiatives was the Armenian Genocide Oral History Collection, launched in 1983. The project is comprised of over 700, 786, I think to be exact, videotaped interviews uh, with survivors of the Armenian genocide. It has proved an invaluable resource for researchers um, in providing details for life both before, uh, during, and after the genocide. If you're interested, my colleagues will be putting the link uh, to learn more in the chat box, if you can find it on the bottom of your screen. Uh, more recently, the Institute has had a chance to showcase some of the videos from this collection um, with the clips from the collection series. Um, more information also in the chat box for that there. Um, last year, to mark Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day, which of course is coming up in just a couple of days, um, we released this video series. They are all on YouTube, free to watch. And we really encourage you to check this out this year, maybe send to someone on uh, the 24th. So more information in the link below. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, giving us a guide to personal digital archiving, uh, Cassandra Tavuxian. Uh, welcome, Cassandra. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll give a little intro and I'll let you tell everyone a bit more about yourself. Uh, Cassandra is an archivist and a researcher uh, with a background in film and photography preservation and collections management. And she is currently the digital collections management specialist at the Canadian Museum of History. So thank you for joining us, Cassandra. I'll let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Jennifer, for the warm welcome. And thank you, Zorian, for inviting me to present this workshop. And thank you all for joining us tonight. So as Jennifer mentioned, I am an archivist and researcher with a background in photographic preservation and collections management. Over the last three years, I've worked closely with um, digital collections, both born digital and digitized records. Uh, from January 2018 to February 2020, I was the Digital Archive and Outreach Officer at the Multicultural History Society of Ontario in Toronto. And since March of 2020, I've been at the Canadian Museum of History in Gatineau, Quebec, as the Specialist of Digital Collections Management. While I was at the MHSO, I worked directly in managing and preserving digitized oral history collections and transcriptions. And it was in this role that I was first exposed to what is involved in the caring for digital collections. And in my current role at the museum, I'm essentially doing the same thing, but at a much larger scale. And I'm working with uh, photographs, audiovisual, and textual materials. I've gleaned a lot from both these experiences, and I'm excited to share with you what I've learned over the past few years working in the field. So just to give an overview of what we're going to be doing tonight, we will be reviewing what I call the five main steps of digital archiving. These are very common and well-recognized procedures in the field. So we'll discuss what digital archiving is, what kinds of materials we might want to archive and why. We will also be looking at some more advanced topics such as file formats and storage, tools and techniques, and common risks and dangers and how to avoid them, most importantly. And hopefully by the end of this workshop, you will feel a little bit more confident in managing and preserving your digital collections. I realize this can be a very daunting and overwhelming task to tackle, myself included. Every day at work, I feel very overwhelmed by the technology and the standards that are constantly adjusting and changing. And it's the role of the digital archivist to adjust to the times and to create solutions. I also wanna recognize that we all have different resources, different budgets and technologies available to us. So depending on your unique situation, whether you're an independent scholar, a student, or simply someone who's trying to preserve their family history, I recognize that we all have different limitations. So not every solution that I offer will be applicable or possible for everyone, but I hope that I will give you some options. The most important thing that you can do that is in your control is to be consistent, 
and in to in some way or form document the processes that you decide to take in order to ensure long-term preservation, usability, and access to your collection. So I'll try to keep the pres uh, presentation portion less than an hour, and then we can have more time to address some questions that you may have. So with that, I will begin. So since we're here to talk about digital archiving, I thought it would be helpful to just review some terminology to make sure that we're all on the same page. This may already be very obvious for some, but not for others. So first, at the most basic level, what is an archive? An archive is an accumulation of relevant historical documents in the place where these records are stored. So archives exist in a variety of places, such as the museums, like the Canadian Museum of History, universities, government agencies, or nonprofit organizations, such as Zorian Institutes, they have an archive. Uh, and it may even exist in your home office or your computer, as we'll see later on. And then archiving is the actual process that includes a number of practices and decisions that are geared towards supporting the long-term preservation, use, and accessibility of content with enduring value. This is a term that archivists use a lot, enduring value. It basically means you've chosen a material or a collection that is worthy of being preserved long-term. And in the digital world, these terms still apply and they remain relevant. However, both the accumulation of an archive and the process of archiving exists in digital form as opposed to physical or analog. And I will dive into these differences a bit more in the coming slides. So it's important to identify and define certain terms that are relevant to the digital archiving process. It's very important to uh, differentiate between born digital versus digitized. So born digital are files that are created on your computer or digital devices, such as a camera or an application, and they are considered born digital because they originate as digital content rather than a digital surrogate of a physical or analog material, such as a photograph or a, um, digital photographs or Word documents. These are all born digital content. So they don't exist anywhere outside of the digital world. And digitization is the process of converting a physical or analog medium into a digital format through scanning, recording, or other digital capture techniques. So this could be scanning a document or a letter, scanning an analog film negative, or just photographing a physical 3D object. These are all digitized records as opposed to born digital. And file formats is something that I'm gonna be talking quite a bit about tonight. So just so we are all on the same page, File formats are encoding standards that allow computers to store and access information as different types of media, so it can be rendered by a software. File formats are commonly referred to by the extension that appears at the end of the file name, such as a PDF, MP3, or TIFF. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with these. So you know, a, a PDF is for a Word document, MP3 would be for sound or audio, and TIFF is for an image or a photograph. Obsolescence is another big thing that uh, archivists, most specifically digital archivists, are very concerned with. So obsolescence is when a file format, disk media, or computer system is no longer widely used or supported. And there's a growing risk that the digital content it contains may one day become completely inaccessible. This is an archivist's worst nightmare because one of our main responsibilities is ensuring the preservation and access of information. So if we're unable to access a file format or a document off of a, a hard drive or storage media or machine or whatever it may be, we are in danger of losing this information. And as digital archivists, we are concerned with migrating content from more at-risk formats and storage media to more stable standards that are likely to remain accessible over time. So it's also important to understand what archiving is not. So it's not a one-time action. It's not putting something on a shelf and not looking at it again unattended. It's not putting your digital content on a CD or a hard drive and just leaving it aside. And it's not a one-time backup that you do at one point and just you know, put it aside. So essentially what I'm really want to emphasize is that archiving is an active process. It requires management, intervention, and maintenance. It is not a one-time access, a one-time process. Rather, it's a long-term process. So we're always thinking in long-term as archivists in whichever formats or mediums that you're actually working with. So when we talk about digital archiving, what kinds of materials are we actually talking about? The materials that you may wanna archive digitally do not differ much from the physical or analog world. 
As long as we deem these materials worthy of some kind of value, we can archive them for the future. So this is just a list of um, different materials you may want to archive. So you might have family photographs, both born digital that are taken on a digital camera or digitized from analog like prints or negatives. You might have creative or scholarly work like your essays or articles or your PhD thesis. Uh, you might have bureaucratic documents depending on where you work like for a government agency. Or you might just have a personal interest collection. Maybe you like to collect stamps or <laughs> historical songs, or it could be just a personal interest that you have. Um, it could also be correspondence, both personal or professional. Home movies is another really common one for families that they want to preserve their family history and family memories. Uh, web content and social media. Maybe you're a really active tweeter and you want to record all your tweets, you know, and make sure that they're archived because who knows what will happen with, you know, these applications, like anything could happen. So you want to make sure you have a backup. And oral histories, of course, which I'm most familiar with. And I know that the Zorian also has a very impressive collection. So these are very his important historical records um, so that you also want to consider archiving or you should archive. And of course, there's, there's many more. And this depends on whether you're working for an institution, if you're an individual or an organization, or just simply managing your personal files or family collection. But these are just some options to consider. So it's really important to understand the difference between physical or analog and digital archiving and materials. Digital preservation is still a fairly new and evolving field. It's really only the last 20 or 30 years that we've started to think about how to care and manage and preserve digital material. And the technology that we use to store and access digital material, whether it's a computer or a mobile phone, are not necessarily designed to help us with long-term preservation. And it's important to understand this because in many ways, we are forced or obliged to use consumer products that eventually become obsolete and therefore unusable over time. So we essentially, unfortunately, have no say or control over how these products evolve over time. So I believe that we need to empower ourselves to care for the content that we're creating. And why is this important for digital content? Um, there are so many unknowns. And as an archivist, I have no way of knowing whether a certain file format or storage media will become obsolete. I can make some educated guesses based on the evolution of certain formats and media, but I am ultimately not in control of this. And it's very easy to assume that digital media is more stable and advanced. And in some ways it can be, but digital media comes with many risks and many unknowns. What we do know is that physical materials are actually quite stable. So we can reasonably expect that if nothing drastic happens, if you have, don't have a fire or flood or mold on your physical collections, we can expect that you'll be able to access this information in the future. It might not be perfect, it might have faded over time, especially with film and photographs, for example, they're very fragile and they're sensitive to their environments. But generally speaking, if you put a, a book on a shelf, it's pretty safe for the, for the long term. But when it comes to digital materials, like digital photographs or emails, these require storage containers that they live on. And these containers need to be stored properly and in proper environments. So these can be hard drives, CDs, or USBs, or, or phones. And we need to uh, use these pieces of technology to access the content. And unfortunately, as many of us may have experienced, these devices fail. They become obsolete over time. And it, in addition to the actual devices becoming obsolete, the file formats can also become obsolete. So we need to be periodically migrating or converting our files so that we can continue to access them. And I also want to note that digital preservation requires a lot of energy, just not just time and resources, but like actual energy to um, maintain the technology, um, to maintain the, the, the server and the hardware that's, all, that's involved. And we don't really talk about this a lot in the field uh, in terms of sustainability and environmental concerns, but it does take up a lot of energy. Um, so unlike traditional or analog collections, the digital collections that we are creating require new skills and new knowledge to know how to access these materials in the future. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to help you figure out some solutions. So you may recognize some of these obsolete digital storage media. Uh, you'll see a floppy disk in the red. Uh, you'll see a CD-ROM underneath here. There's a USB, there's flash drives. And this is, a, I think, it's some kind of a cassette tape. Um, 
So you may think, but I use USBs and flash drives all the time. They are still very commonly used, but you may notice in the new laptops that are being sold, they do no longer have CD drives, they no longer have USBs. You need to buy an attachment to go into that, whatever output the computer has to actually attach your USB or your CD. So this is just like one clue that the consumer products are telling us that eventually these are gonna become like less common. So these are the clues that we're getting from the products themselves. Um, so this doesn't mean, you know, I'm not saying if you have things on CDs or USBs, you're, you're doomed. It's not, that's not the case, but you do need to keep, keep aware of this. Um, so yeah, and, and it doesn't mean that you can't migrate your content off of CDs or off of USBs. There are many options for this. Um, at the museum, for example, we, about 10 years ago, um, we were converting all our CDs onto the server. So, you know, it's, it's things that we're, we're working towards. Um, to convert the materials and to stay up to date. Um, yes. So if you do have some storage media or formats at home that you're not sure how to identify or what to do with, I would highly recommend the Museum of Obsolete Media. They have resources on media preservation, obsolescence ratings and media stability ratings, which are really helpful. So they have, it's an it's amazing resource and I would highly recommend it if you need some guidance. So what happens if we don't take steps to care for our digital content? We talked about obsolescence. We talked about you know, file loss. There's a lot of things that can happen. Um, and unfortunately, if we don't take some kind of preservation action, uh, our digital content is at risk of becoming lost, unretrievable, or degraded over time. So here's just some examples. You could accidentally or deliberately, someone else could delete or destroy your content forever. It may exist somewhere, but no one knows how to find it. So it could be really disorganized, or maybe the file names are, there's weird file names. You don't know how to, how to read the files. Uh, they could be retrievable, but not understandable. So you're lacking contextual information or metadata to be able to understand the files. They can also degrade over time, just like with paper or photographs, which degrade over time. There can be file corruption or bit loss that happens. Or, you know, as I, I've brought up already, inaccessible, inaccessible formats, so obsolescence of either the media or the file. And this is a bit of a scary stat, but without intervention, the life expectancy of digital files can be as short as five years. So this is obviously a really, you know, extreme scenario, but, if, if, but the risk is there and you need to keep this in mind. Um, of course, they can last a, lot, last a lot longer than this, but you need to take actions and steps to, to help that happen and to prevent that loss. So if there are so many risks involved, why do we want to archive? There are several different reasons as to why you would want to archive your collections. At the most basic level, archiving allows for long-term preservation and access to information. So it might be material that's really important to you for your family or have an emotional attachment to, and you want to make sure that future generations can access that material. It might have historical or cultural significance, such like the Zorian Institute, they have uh, oral histories with genocide survivors, for instance, so these hold a lot of cultural and historical significance. Or you might have a legal or financial requirement. Some institutions require um, time-specific retention schedules. They have to keep certain files for a certain amount of time. So these are just some reasons or some, some reasons as to why you would want to archive. So now we will begin with the five steps of digital archiving. And again, these are standardized in the field. And there are a lot of resources out there thanks to universities and governments and organizations that lay out these very steps that you can reference in your own time as well. So we'll go over each of the steps in detail. They work in unison with each other, but they are also equally important in their own. <clears throat> so the first thing is identifying and selecting. The second ste step is gathering and importing, organizing and describing, backup and storage, and finally, the maintenance and checkup. So the first step is identifying and selecting your collection material. You wanna first identify the scope and the quantity of your collection. You'll wanna ask yourself some very basic questions. What do you have? What kind of function does it hold or what format is it in? Where is it stored? Is it on a hard drive, a computer or a USB? How much do you have? Do you know the number of files and how much space it requires? Um, we use gigabytes and terabytes, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. 
who made it and who did it come from? And you may also want to ask yourself, can you actually access it? So what storage media is it on? Is it on an obsolete format? What condition is it in? You also want to ask yourself uh, whether it's confidential or sensitive material and whether the material is active or non-active. So meaning if it's active, you're continuously opening, updating, and changing the files. And if it's non-active, it's something that you can set aside and don't have to look at again for a while. And my biggest tip here would be to not try to save everything, just like with paper or analog records, not all digital files are worth the time and resources to save. So this could include duplicates and older versions of files. Um, you know, even at the museum, we have so many versions of files and just sorting through that is a, is a nightmare. So make sure you're deleting duplicates and older versions that you don't need anymore because it takes up a lot of space. So now, how do you actually decide uh, what to preserve? When deciding what to save, consider the following questions. This is like a common question. Um, if you were to lose, like if your devices crashed tomorrow, what would you most regret losing? This is one of the most common questions you could ask yourself. Um, which digital files represent irreplaceable memories, important life events, or valuable creative work? So this could be like your PhD thesis or um, you know, photographs of your family, things that are irreplaceable and unique. Um, and which digital files tell meaningful stories about your life? So again, it could be family, it could be scholarly or creative work. Um, these are all things that you want to consider when you're deciding what to preserve. And these are just some other factors that may help you determine what to select and prioritize for archiving. In other words, you'll need to determine what is uh, of enduring value. So again, it could be a memento, a unique or irreplaceable item or content. Preservation and technical risks is another thing. Like if you have an old film that is deteriorating over time, it has like mold, digitization might be a way to actually preserve it for the long term if the actual analog is you know, on its way out. So in many ways, it's a, it's a way to avoid risk digitizing. Maybe someone important created it, um, you know, a significant historical figure or family member. They might have uh, artifactual um, value, research or historical value, monetary value. These are all things that you want to consider. And of course, legal or financial requirements as well. So now that you've identified what you want to preserve and you've selected it, you'll need to gather and import your content. And this is where we get a little more technical. Um, so as was suggested, you may have content that exists in different locations. It could be on your computer, on your phone, or hard drives, or VHS, or CDs. And they all have a variety of different challenges for accessing. So you're going to want to figure out where your files are um, that you want to keep. And you want to copy them onto a central computer so that they can be backed up. So you're going to want to think about where all your content is. Like I said before, computers, tablets, electronic devices, hard drives, emails, another thing that we often don't consider about archiving, or right, cloud services that you might have. Um, and you're going to want to gather and import this into a centralized location so that you can better manage the content from your laptop or your desktop computer. So when it comes to what to import, so once you've decided the actual content, you want to import the exact copy of the actual digital file without any encryption. So you want to make sure it's the highest possible quality and the highest file size, if you can afford to have the size or the, the space. And you want to preserve the most authentic copy. So in archiving terms, we use preservation copy and access copy. So preservation is the one that is the highest quality, it's the highest size, but you're not going to be using it all the time. It's kind of like the a digital version of like a negative for, in for photographic terms. And the access file is one that you would actually upload or share with your friends. Um, so here like a TIFF is like a higher quality version for photos. Um, so that would be like the preservation version. And a JPEG is more of the access file. So one that you would share more easily and it takes up less space. So there are several ways to transfer or import your content to a central computer. And you'll want to transfer your material through some kind of hardware interface. This is done by using a cable, most likely a USB cable. And even if you have content on a CD or a flash drive and your computer or laptop doesn't actually have the attachment or the, the, the piece for you to put, put the USB in, I don't know the exact term. Uh, as I said before, there are attachments that you can buy to help you 
access information from your CDs, even if you don't have the uh, ability to do it from your laptop directly. So you can use USBs, USB 3s and 4s are very more commonly used these days, Thunderbolt, Firewire, um, memory card readers, actually faster than USBs for cameras. So if you're, if you're taking content off of a camera, I would recommend using it from the memory card itself and putting that into your computer. And you wanna make sure it's compatible to your phone or your digital camera. So sometimes certain cables are more compatible with Macs versus PCs. So you just wanna make sure you're, you're using compatible um, uh, applications. So this might be obvious for some, but not others, but just so we're on the same page. So when it comes to actually importing your content, whether it's a phone or a camera or a scanner, you're gonna have different options for importing and copying the material. And sometimes there is specific software that is required. So if you're using a scanner, for instance, like Epson scanner, it's gonna come with certain kind of software for you to scan your photos and then import it to your computer. This is just a screenshot for the photo app on the Mac, which most people should have. So when you plug in your device, whether it's a scanner or a, or a, a camera or a scanner, you're gonna see an option to import your material. And there are more advanced programs such as Adobe Bridge, which I also recommend. Uh, it's an application where you can manage and organize your files and your, your photos. So you can import it directly from your camera or your scanner, whatever it may be. You wanna get it onto a, a centralized location. So up to this point, we've identified and imported all our existing digital content into one centralized location or computer. Now we need to think about how to actually organize and describe the material. This is often the most time consuming process because it requires a little more institutional or contextual knowledge rather than technical or automized processes. Although there are ways to organize and describe your content in automized batches, so you're gonna to need to organize and describe your material, not only for long-term preservation, but for it to be accessible in the future. This is the key. Otherwise, you're just looking at a bunch of random files and images, and you have no way to actually read or process the information. So this is where file management, um, which includes file naming and format, and descriptive information, such as metadata, becomes important. And I will get into this more in detail. So first, the most basic level is file management. In the digital sphere, organizing and describing your material refers to how we name our files and our folders. So this can be also, so once you name the files and folders, you actually have to arrange the nests that the folders go into and how we handle the files and the folders. So you can imagine it's like a digital version of a file cabinet that you would see at a library or an archive. This is the same thing, just in digital form. So when you're deciding how you're gonna organize your collection, you probably don't need to start from zero. There are probably already ways that you inherently organize your material that are a good starting point. And sometimes the devices that you use already, oops, I went ahead, already name the files for you. You might notice when you plug in your phone to gather, uh, to import your photos, you'll see they already have file names that might include the date or whatever, the way it's set up. Um, so there is no like one perfect way to do this. It really depends on the institution. You know, they all have their own file management systems. There are some institutional standards and recommendations, but it's essentially up to the institution or the individual, however they want to do it. Um, so I would suggest just go with your natural instinct and to go with your needs. So if you are a person that's more organized chronologically, you know, organize your files and folders by date, for instance. So here's a screenshot from the museum. Um, so on the left, this is how we organize our server. So it's all organized by the actual type or the material. So we have AV for audiovisual, Biblio is for the library, corporate is, uh, Corpo is for corporate records, image is for photographs, media, I'm actually not sure. I don't actually, I've never gone into that folder. And text is for textual records. And then within each of these folders is another set of folders. And this could include the department, the researcher's name or the date. So I just showed you here, this is the, um, the nest for images. So once we click on images, we see from the 70s and on, I just showed a, a little screenshot here, but all the acquisitions that we've done um, are in folders by date. And this just helps you find information more easily. It's just as simple as that. So I would just recommend picking a method and sticking with it and being consistent. That's the most important thing. 
So you'll also want to decide on a file naming standard or convention. This will help you access the material. So I would recommend uh, unique, concise, and descriptive keywords. And I, again, consistency is very important. And these are just some tips that I can recommend. Keep your file name short, less than 25 characters. And um, it can be very hard to read long names and also it, it creates problems for the computer. So it's better to abbreviate when possible. You wanna avoid special characters, just avoid them. It, it makes things a lot difficult. Uh, you can use underscores instead of spaces, but other than the underscore, I would avoid any other ca special characters. Um, so when it comes to actually deciding the format, again, just go with what you what what your needs are. Um, there are ways of doing this in batches as well, so you don't have to like individually manually name each file. Um, Adobe Bridge offers uh, options for you to batch file name, which is very convenient, especially if you have like hundreds of files. It saves a lot of time. Um, so you also want to establish, you know, acronyms or abbreviations. Um, this is an example from the MHSO, uh, which I use when I was helping a family uh, digitize their collection. So IMG stands for image, ARM stands for Armenian. At the MHSO, we had a variety of different ethnocultural groups that we used acronyms for. And then this is the unique number that is given to each file. Um, it, you, you don't have to do a number that long, that's just what we did. And then Selm refers to the donor's name in this case. So her name was Mona Selian. She was the person that I was digitizing her collection. So I used the last three letters of her last name and the first letter of her first name. It's just what worked for us. And once we stuck, once we chose it, we just stuck with it. So this is a format that you can use if you want. Um, there are many others out there. Now we're going to talk about the different file formats. Um, so digital archivists encourage people to use what are called open file formats. These can be used and implemented by everyone and they're published and they're easily recreated. So these are open standard formats. I would avoid using any kind of proprietary or closed format. Um, these are designed in secret and they are uh, designed according to a particular encoding system. So essentially it's a company that wants to keep it to themselves and they create a file format and then they don't publish the code and it's basically confidential or private. So this increases the chances that if the company ceases to exist, you might actually not be able to access those files. And this is a serious concern. So avoid any closed proprietary formats. Luckily, many of the common file formats that we use are open standard. So this isn't a huge concern, but it's just something to be aware of. And these are some recommended open standard file formats, which I'm sure you all are familiar with by now. Um, so these are all very commonly used. Uh, I will just point out PDF A for, for text files. These are more archivally friendly and more recommended by archivists. They're optimized for long-term preservation and stability. So once you're in Adobe PDF, you can just save as PDF A and it, it just prolongs the life of the, the file. Um, you know, Word docs and Excel are very commonly used. When it comes to images, RAW, this is more for, if you're a photographer, or like a digital camera, you'll know what a RAW file is. It's basically like the negative version, a digital negative. Um, it's like the biggest, the highest quality, um, most RAW version of the file. Um, but they take up a lot of space, so not everyone uses them. TIFF is very commonly used for uh, photographs. They're uncompressed and they're the highest quality, we highly recommend TIFFs. And JPEGs are used quite commonly as well, especially for on the web, when you're uploading images to the web, most of the time they're always JPEGs, but they do lose quality over time. So each time you save a JPEG, you're actually losing information. So this is just something to keep in mind. It doesn't mean don't use them, but just something to keep in mind. And with audio files, again, uh, WAVE is preferred for preservation. It's higher quality, higher file size, and MP3 is what is used for the web. Uh, when you listen to music on streaming uh, platforms like Spotify, those are all MP3s. And with video, AVI and MLV are recommended for preservation and MP4 is most widely used uh, for video. So YouTube is all MP4s basically. They won't allow you to upload anything else, I'm pretty sure. 
Okay, now another technical aspect to be aware of is file compression. This is most relevant to photographs and film specifically. So compression is basically, it's used by your computer to reduce the size of the file by eliminating data that it considers redundant. So this may result in permanent reduction in quality and or image loss or degradation over time. So this might be fine for everyday use of files, but you may want to be aware of this type of compression uh, when you're saving important files for long-term preservation. You're going to also want to be aware of lossy and lossless files. So lossy files, such as JPEGs, every time you save it, as I mentioned, you're losing information. The computer is throwing away parts of the file every time you save it. Um, there are ways that you can prevent the loss. So when you're saving a file, you can actually select best, which would mean it's throwing away less uh, information. So that's one thing that you can do to prevent um, long-term loss. Um, but I would also just recommend for long-term preservation, avoid JPEGs altogether and just use TIFFs because they're lossless, which means that there is no um, compression over time. This is especially important if you want to print or enlarge any files or photographs. Compression becomes really important with this. So it's just something to be aware of. And I wanted to show an example. So on the left is a low compression, high quality JPEG. And on the right is a high compression, low quality. Did I already say that? I think I got it mixed up. But um, so the left is um, higher quality. Uh, so you'll see it's not the best file already on its own. It wasn't the highest quality, but you'll see there is a difference between the two. The one on the right is uh, harder to read. Um, so over time, it's going to degrade and you won't be able to use it. So there's subtle differences, but you can you can really you can notice it quite clearly in this one that it's quite a bit foggy and harder to read. So just keep that in mind. OK, moving on to metadata. Uh, so metadata is what archivists call data about data. Um, so it basically enables us to organize, locate, and understand our content. And without this information, we are left with a lot of gaps and questions when it comes to institutional knowledge. So this is just a classic example from the museum's uh, catalog record. We use uh, a cataloging collection management software system. So before even looking at the actual item, we can already tell a lot about this from just looking at the metadata. So here we have the title. Um, you know, the description wasn't filled out in this case, but you could do the description. There's the rights, bibliography, institution, department. And this is just one tab of many, many tabs in our, in our software. So this is just, there's a lot of more information that you can input to supply metadata. So which metadata fields are most important? Um, you're going to want to need to decide what kind is going to be most useful for you, what kind of metadata. These are just some suggestions that I would recommend. Um, there are institutional standards for archival description and arrangement. Uh, one of the standards is in Canada, it's called Rules for Archival Description, otherwise known as RAD. Um, but if you're just doing it for a personal collection, just stick with like the very basics. Um, and it's, it's ultimately up to you. But so these are just some I would recommend. The creator. So that could be who actually took the photograph. A description. Two women sitting in a field. The date. The file format. Whether it's a TIFF or a JPEG. Uh, duration. That's more for if it's a film or if it's audio. Location. Where this was taken. And any copyright information that there may be. This is also very important if you want to donate your materials to an archive. They're going to want to know all this information beforehand, and it would really help them a lot if you have it already. OK, so there are a number of different ways to capture the metadata. Um, you can do it manually, but there are also ways that it can be captured automatically through our devices. So a lot of camera settings will already have it embedded in the file. So when you export your photographs from your camera, it'll, a lot of the time, it'll already have metadata into it. It'll have the date, it'll have the location, and you can get into more detail. Uh, as you want. Um, you might also want to capture additional information or metadata. So you can rename the files, like I mentioned earlier, file naming standard. That's also part of the metadata, the actual file name. You can also create spreadsheets. Um, you can do a catalog, use, use a catalog software. Of course, if you're in an institution, this is highly recommended. You can also embed the metadata into the file itself. So you can use Photoshop and Bridge to actually put information like keywords or 
you know, whatever you want to add into the actual file itself. So this is just an example, very basic, just the preview on the Mac, but it gives you all this information about this photograph. So here it says when it was created, uh, where it is on my computer, the size it takes up on the computer, uh, the, the file format, so it was a JPEG, when it was last opened, the size, all this information is already documented into the file itself. So the next step is backup and storage. Uh, so at this point, you've identified your files, you've gathered and imported the content onto a centralized location, and you've described and organized them. And you've also named your files and created the nests like we talked about. So now we need to actually store and backup the material. So there are a few things to consider. You want to first consider what kind of expertise you have. Do you have a lot of technical knowledge or awareness, or maybe you don't really know how to use a computer that well, so you need to kind of consider what, what your, your strengths and weaknesses are when you're deciding. You also want to consider the size of your collection. So when you're buying a, a hard drive or whatever it may be, you want to know how much, uh, how much size your files are taking up so you know what to buy. You also want to know how often you want to access the collection. Is it every week? Is it monthly or just once a year? And you also want to consider um, if you have any privacy concerns or security concerns. Um, this will also play a role into how you decide which backup or storage to use. So when it comes to storage and backup, there is no one best solution. You'll need to figure out what works best for you and your particular circumstances and your resources and your budget. And again, these are consumer devices and systems. So start by choosing based on what you can afford uh, and also what you can afford to upkeep and replace and know how to manage that. So we also need to consider the lifespan of the technology as we talked about obsolescence. This is something to always keep in the back of your mind. And you wanna choose based on what you need in terms of capacity and access. So whether how, how often do you wanna access it, access your material? Um, is it personal or sensitive material? And um, so these are just other ones, other recommendations. Um, like when it comes to backing up, you wanna have at least one backup on a separate device, ideally. So you don't want all your information just on one space. You wanna make sure that they're in a variety of different spaces. So if something happens to one of them, you have a backup of the other one. So at the museum, we often have at least two or three backups of our material. And we have like an offsite one, like outside of the museum completely where we have some of our, our data and storage. And so that's something to keep in mind. Of course, it's not possible for everyone, but so when you're planning for storage and backup, you need to anticipate your needs. If you're actively digitizing your photographs, for instance, you will need to figure out a storage system that not only allows you to store what you have at this moment, but what you will continue to collect and accumulate over time. So you need to know that you can add content to your system as it grows, and also that you can get the content off of the system if something should go wrong or something should happen. So it's all about anticipating your needs, um, doing research and, and you're testing different workflows. Um, you need to plan to replace your devices in the future, like I've already mentioned. And just like any purchase, you wanna do research and you can look up user reviews to see um, you know, how, the, how the device works and you know, just what the users actually think of the device. So I will recommend a couple of storage options. We are probably most familiar with portable or external hard drives. At the museum, we use them very, very frequently. They are increasingly very affordable. Unless you're working with really large video files, then it becomes really expensive to get enough space. Um, but you're probably looking at around $100 to $500 to store your collection. Again, you want to make sure you do your research and look at the reviews. And it's really important to understand that there are two kinds of hard drives. There are hard drive disks and there are solid state drives. So hard drive disks have a spinning component to them and they need to be exercised regularly. So if you, you know, haven't looked at your hard drive for a couple of years, I would recommend plugging it in just to make sure it's, it's still spinning. Uh, it just needs to be exercised regularly um, unless uh, otherwise it could break down. So just plug it in periodically. Um, but otherwise, I would recommend a solid solid state drive. They are more expensive, but they are ultimately more stable and appropriate for long-term preservation. And just like with physical collections, you need to make sure the storage media and devices are stored in 
you know, you want to avoid extreme temperatures. You don't want it to be too hot or too cold. Uh, you want to avoid direct light or um, direct moisture and dust. These are all things that will help prolong the life of your, your digital content. So some more risky and non-recommended storage options. Um, so of course, USBs and CDs are still very commonly used today, um, but they're not necessarily the most um, preservation friendly. So USBs and flash drives are very convenient because they are small. They don't take up a lot of physical space and it's very easy to transfer files. So if you're just transferring files, that's fine. You can use a USB. It, it's when it comes to long-term storage that it becomes an issue. Um, they are very small, so they're very easy to lose. They're not really easy to label. They all look the same. So it's, it's, hard, it's just harder to manage when you have a lot of them. Um, but when it comes to CDs, unfortunately, optical disks are much less reliable, reliable than expected. And they're actually reaching the end of their lifespan. So the estimated lifespan of a CD is about 20 to 25 years. Um, so this is a bit of a concern, um, especially if you have uh, unique information on CDs that doesn't exist anywhere else. You wanna make sure you have a secondary backup. Um, so these, both of these are considered temporary or secondary options, but they're not reliable for long-term preservation um, and access. And like I said, at the museum, we recently transferred all of our data and material from CDs onto the server. So this is just part of the process. The last storage option is cloud storage. Um, so cloud storage, it, kind of, it seems kind of abstract, but it's uh, essentially you're storing your content on someone else's computer. This might be practical for some because you don't actually have to worry about plugging anything in or you know, there's no physical component to it. Um, but we want to keep in mind that these are private commercial services and they don't care about your content like you do. Um, so you essentially have less control of your content and this might be concerning, especially if you are archiving your personal or sensitive material. It's unlikely that your material will be shared publicly without your consent, but you never know these days. Um, and to make sure that, you know, just make sure you do your due diligence and be vigilant and keep yourself informed in order to avoid any kind of data loss. Or, you know, if the company goes out of business, you know, you wanna make sure you have an exit strategy, an exit plan, basically, if, if, if something should happen. Um, so yes, yeah, so the remote, um, it's stored on multiple servers. So you're, you're accessing it all through the web. You're uploading your material and you're accessing it all through the web. There's no like hard, hardware or hard drive connected to it. Um, so, you know, just for instance, Google Drive, they emailed me a few weeks ago, letting me know that they're going to be deleting my content if I don't sign in in seven days. Luckily, it wasn't really an issue for me. I hadn't even, I didn't even remember that I made it. So at least they notified me, but, you know, they could delete your, your content anytime. So you just want to make sure that um, you've done your research and you know what you're getting into, essentially. Now, when it comes to maintenance and checkup, so at this point, we've done the first four steps, you've identified, you've imported, you've described and organized, and you've stored them. And now you wanna do the regular maintenance and checkup. Um, so as was indicated previously, digital preservation or archiving requires active maintenance over time to ensure that your materials are accessible. So you wanna check your storage and files annually to ensure the accessibility. Do not wait until your computer crashes to discover that your storage has failed you in some way. So I would suggest, you know, every six months or every year, just check in on your, open some random files, do a couple spot checks just to make sure everything's okay and that there's no data loss or anything like that. And you wanna refresh your storage media every five to seven years. So very common, I'm sure many of you have dealt with hard drives that have crashed. And so just to, to avoid that, just keep in mind when you bought it and, you know, keep doing your research. Sometimes the company will give recommendations on the next upgrade or whatever it may be. Um, so you just wanna make sure that you're aware of this when you're, when you're purchasing and when you're maintaining the up, upkeep of your, of your files. So now that we've gone over the five steps, uh, I also wanted to provide some further information uh, for those of you who may have family photographs, audio or film that they're interested in having digitized. So I really wanna emphasize that analog formats, primarily audio and film 
are inherently self-destructive and they simply will not last forever, unfortunately, especially if they're not stored properly. So if you have, um, you know, a box of film, old film in like your basement or your attic, I would really recommend, you know, taking them out and just checking on them and make sure they're okay and consider getting them digitized. Um, you know, the storage requirements for film and photo are worthy of a whole other workshop in itself. But what I can say that it's incredibly important to store these more fragile items in a controlled environment, low temperature, low acidity, and relative humidity. And if you're simply not able to store your analog or physical materials that are at risk of deterioration, digitization is a really good way to prolong the life of the materials. Um, so you wanna just keep this in mind when you're selecting and prioritizing what you wanna digitize. And these are just some advantages um, to digitizing in general. So of course, as we know, many formats become obsolete. They need to be reformatted. Some of them are very unstable and degrade over time, such as film. Um, digital copies makes it easier to just simply share your content. You know, Instead of mailing a box of photos or a box of film, you can just send them electronically to your family and friends. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good solution in this regard. Um, I also wanted to provide some recommended digitization vendors in case you guys are interested. Um, so when you're selecting a vendor, you can email them. Uh, you can email several vendors to get different quotes and compare the quotes. I would highly recommend these services if you have very fragile or deteriorating uh, obsolete formats. They have expertise, knowledge, and they have the equipment to actually do the work properly and to do the quality control. So in Toronto, Digital Treasures is a vendor that we've used before at the museum. Uh, Media Preserve is the one I'm most familiar with because we use them at the Multicultural History Society of Ontario as well. The museum also uses them. They're in the States, so there's issues with you know, shipping and you know, with the borders, there's, it can be delayed. Um, but these are both really good options. And then in Ottawa, the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, CRK, and they also offer digitization services if you're interested. So essentially you can send them the material and your hard drive or USB, and they can transfer the material onto the device that you choose, and then they'll send it back to you. It's a very seamless process. Sometimes it takes a while because there's a lot of backlog. Um, and you can also ask vendors to apply metadata to your files and they can embed it into the actual files if, if required. So that's what we do at the museum. We ask them, we send them our metadata and they put it in the files. So that's a really, just, I thought I'd just share this with you guys uh, if, if you're considering digitizing your collections. Finally, I wanted to touch upon social media in case you're interested in saving the content that you upload. Um, and I want to be clear that social media apps are great for sharing your material and information, but they are not archival storage or preservation options. Um, so these are just some of the most popular apps that I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, so yeah, one thing to keep in mind, the, every time you upload your material, they're shipping metadata and they're compressing your files. So it's losing quality over time every time you upload something. Because again, they're not they're not preservation. They're not they're not thinking about preservation or long-term storage. These uh, applications. So with Facebook, luckily you can download um, your full account if you want to. I have never personally done it, but you can if you want. Uh, if you're a Google user, you can export your Gmail, your calendar, and your Google Drive through this application called Google Takeout. Uh, Twitter allows you to export all of your tweets into a spreadsheet. A CSV spreadsheet. So if that's important to you, you might want to consider that. And Instagram, you can view your data, but you can't actually download any of your data. So just keep that in mind that you can't really access. I mean, you can view it, you can view all the information that they have, but you can actually download it to keep to yourself. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then just some final general notes to consider for long-term preservation, whether you're working with with physical or digital collections. Um, the most important thing I, in my personal view is organizing and describing. This helps others understand, preserve and promote access to your materials. This is especially important if you wanna donate your materials. Uh, it's really important to keep in mind. Um, engaging with your family or your stakeholders. So if you have elder family members that you wanna 
you know, do an oral history interview, for instance, or take photographs of. This is really important to think about when you're preserving your family history, for instance, or historical or cultural significance. So actually engage with people and your family or friends. And then consider donating. So if you have a collection, I mean, it's important to you, but you don't really have the space or the time to manage it, you can consider donating your materials to an archive. So, you know, historical societies are always looking for materials such as the MHSO in Toronto. You can go to a public library, they, they take donations. Community archives, such as the Project Save Armenian Photograph Archive in Watertown, they are actively preserving uh, Armenian photographs from Armenian families, and they preserve them for the long term, and then they create, uh, they put them online to make them accessible. Zorayan Institute is another example of a community archive or a nonprofit organization. University archives also, they accept um, donations if it's particular to the university. And of course, museums. So the CMH, we take donations all the time from donors and families of all kinds. Um, but just keep in mind that every institution has their own collection mandate and they might not accept everything that you have to offer. So it has to go in line with their mandate. So if it might be a really amazing historical document, but it's not part of their mandate to collect those kinds of materials. So don't be offended if they don't accept your material, you'll find a place that does and that, that will want to uh, it for long-term. And I just wanted to end on some of the references that I used today um, and some additional ones. I will admit that the US institutions seem to be a little more advanced when it comes to scholarship and research in this field, but I did include a couple of Canadian examples. Um, so Canadian Heritage Information Network, CHIN, they have a lot of great resources on digital preservation, on file formats, digitization. They give a lot of good uh, resources and suggestions and strategies. LAC, of course, has a lot of guidelines that are easily accessible. Library of Congress is a great resource that I've used many times, and they're really keeping up to date on the digital side of things as well. Um, and then I also wanted to include the digitization standards at the Canadian Museum of History. So if you have like, this is the standards that we use at the museum for digitizing, but you can reference them if you are scanning photographs and you don't know what resolution to do it at. For instance, we can help you with our standards uh, that are archivally sound and, um, uh, you know, archival <laughs> for long-term preservation. Um, and I think that's it. Um, so if you have any questions, I know this was a lot of information all at once. So if you would like some clarification on anything, please let me know and feel free to email me as well. I've left my email there. So thank you for your time. Wow, thank you, Cassandra. I'm suddenly motivated to download the entirety of my Google Photos now. <laughs> I have this, like sudden nightmare that they're all gonna disappear and I think I have thousands. So we will turn to questions. Um, as Cassandra mentioned, that was such a wealth of information. Um, I don't have time to process it. So I'll start. Um, just a note before we get into questions, if you would rather raise your hand, the function is down the bottom, um, go ahead. I can unmute you and you can ask your question out loud, but we'll get started. So Duran asks, I'm not very software and computer literate. Can I contract someone to organize and digitize my family documents and albums? Uh, you, you could. There are freelance archivists that work, um, that don't necessarily work for a particular institution, but they do, such as for yourself, freelance projects. Um, I'm sure there's a database or a directory somewhere that you can find names uh, based on where you live. Um, but I'm, I'm certain that that is a service that is available out there for sure, yeah. Just takes a bit of research to find the right person. And someone else asks, do you have any tips for scanning slash digitizing photographs and or documents? Um, could this be done, for example, with a phone scanning app or does the type of scanner in and of itself play a role in the quality of the scan? It all depends on how you want to use the images. Um, you know, you can use a phone app very easily if you just want to send it to a friend or a family member just to get the information out there. But in terms of quality and long-term preservation, I would recommend uh, buying an actual scanner. Uh, they're not too expensive. Uh, there's a few options out there. Um, Epson has a lot of good scanners for just home archivists and you know family collections. I have one here that I use quite frequently. Um, and they come with uh, different uh, holders. So like if you have a 35 millimeter film or medium format film, depending on what kind of film you have, 
uh, it'll come with different uh, holders and cases. So you can just snap them in and then scan them. Um, for photographs, it's the same thing. You don't need like a specific holder for photographs, but flatbed scanners are very appropriate for that use. Um, if the if it's very fragile, what you have like a glass plate negative, and it's like you don't want to probably you don't want to put it in the scanner bed or the whatever it's called the yeah, scanner bed. You actually might want to photograph the object instead. So, I've worked at uh, when I was at the Ryerson Image Center, for instance, we had very fragile glass plate negatives, and we photographed it with an overhead stand, and just photographed it with light. Oh yeah, that's another thing. You need to have the light underneath to actually bring the photograph to life too. So. Yeah, definitely Epson scanner has a lot of options if you want to do it from home. And then when it comes to the actual resolution and the size, those sort of resources I gave on the last source, um, Library and Archives Canada has a lot of recommendations on how big to think the file size and all those kinds of standards are available. Awesome, thank you. And someone else asks, um, in terms of um, video files, so I have videos stored as .iso files used for DVD. Do you have any recommendations on how to easily convert these files to an MP4 for accessibility? For example, is one format better for long-term preservation? So when it comes to video file, um, WAVE and AVI are recommended for preservation and MP4 is recommended for access. So access meaning you want to share it, preservation meaning you want to keep it aside and, and not touch it. Um, I've never done ISO to mp4 but there are um, websites out there that you can actually con convert files to um, so i would just recommend you know doing a simple google search seeing if a website is available for you to do that conversion other times you might have to buy a specific software or program to do the conversion but it's it's a very common process and something that archivists do on a daily basis so it, it can easily be done with the right program or software um, and is it, someone else asked, is it possible to enhance the audio slash visual quality of an original material in the digitization process? There are ways of doing that. I, I don't personally do that in my day to day, but if you go to one of the vendors that I recommended, um, they have the software and the technology and the expertise to amplify sound, to denoise, like if there's a lot of noise in the background or if there's scratching from the, whatever the medium is, there are ways to make it more clear and, and, and increase the quality. So the vendors can definitely do that for you. Great. And uh, someone asks, so I'm looking to digitize family photographs, but not for some time. In the meantime, is there something I can do now to ensure they remain in good condition for the next couple of years? So I'm not sure how old the photographs are, but assuming that they're not like you know, glass plate or tin type or, you know, one of the older historical processes. Um, and I also don't know if they're in albums. So one thing to consider for family photographs, if they're in those like 70s albums with the sticky film you might be familiar with, those are really bad for preservation. They, they're they very high acidity. Um, so I would recommend if you start to see like deterioration or fading over time, uh, get them out of the albums. That's one thing I would recommend. And you can buy um, uh, acid-free paper and envelopes and boxes at, at archival. There's a lot of like, archival um, stores and services out there that sell supplies to help you preserve your collections. So get, yeah, get them out of the albums, put them in non-acid, acid-free, keep them in a, a low temperature. You don't want it to be deep in the attic or deep, deep in the basement or, or up in the attic where the you know temperature is fluctuating and it's, uh, so keep them in dry, uh, clean, um, yeah, dry and clean <laughs> environments for sure for photographs. I know the exact albums you're talking about with the, yeah, he kind of, <laughs> yeah, difficult to always get the photos in there. So hopefully easier to get them out. Yeah. Um, and someone else says, so you mentioned this briefly, but could you provide some more insight into the process of entering personal and or family archives into the database of a museum or a local historical organization? Um, for example, what do they typically look for in a set of archives? Well, it depends on the actual software and the, the program that is used, but most of them usually have very similar fields. Um, so you're, you're thinking of donating these materials to an archive? Is that? 
if you have a question and you want to elaborate, you're welcome to raise your hand or maybe type a, a secondary message. We can come back to that one in a moment. Uh, let's do a quick one. This is a good one here. What is the safest in terms of security and storage platform to save personal archives? Would a cloud-based server or multiple sets of physical copies be best? It's a tough one. Um, like I said, the cloud services, they can be very practical and convenient for some, but I wouldn't use it as your primary one. You can use it as like a secondary backup just to make sure that you have it somewhere else. Um, but, uh, you know, hard drives are very reliable these days and um, I would stick to hard drives personally and have a, a cloud storage just as like a secondary backup if you can. Great. And a uh, quick one here. How do you choose to save a photo as a TIFF? I assume versus a JPEG or a PNG. Photos taken on a phone are saved as a JPEG. So how would you go about making sure those are TIFFs? If it's, if it's from a phone, I think for iPhones and most mobile phones, it's automatically always a JPEG. So you can't really go from higher quality from the lower quality end. So you, I, don't, I don't think there's a way to go from JPEG to TIFF. You can only go from TIFF to JPEG. So when it comes to phone photographs, um, those are a bit harder when it comes to long-term preservation. But I know if you have like a digital camera and you're working from a raw file, from there, you can save it as a TIFF, and you can do this just through Preview or Photoshop. There's many different applications out there that allow you to save in different file formats for different uses. Great. Um, and another, Antoine asks, does cloud storage solve the issue of file formatting becoming obsolete over time? It could, as long as they're, as long as they're open file formats. Um, which as I, as I said, are the more public and you know, uh, the code has been published and it's more easily usable um, by everyone. Um, yeah, as long as they're open file formats, like if you use a cloud service and they have like their own file format that is that you've never heard of and is uh, private and the closed one that I mentioned, I would avoid those ones because if something was to happen to that cloud service and you're stuck with those file formats, you might not be able to open them in wherever else you, wherever you go next. So whatever you use, just make sure they're open file formats. Um, and then you can find like a list of these online easily. Great. Um, and Artin asks, what app um, application do you suggest for family tree photo archiving? Family tree. Um, that's a good question. I, I personally use Adobe Bridge. Um, I find it to be the most reliable when it comes to managing and um, organizing photographs. It's not specific for family trees in particular, but you know, maybe like, um, what is that service that uh, it's, it's specific to like geneolo genealogical um, services? What is that? It's like a very famous website. Ancestry, I knew it was with an A. They might have some options for photo, for organizing specifically for photo or family tree. I'm not quite sure though, but um, Adobe Bridge is, I highly recommend because you can put metadata, you can do keywords, you can organize it in different ways. Um, you probably could find a way to do it chronologically or by your family you know, system in some way. Um, but maybe look into Ancestry or more genealogical specific services that might be able to cater to those needs more. So I think Artin who asked the question has raised his hand. So Artin, I will unmute you and maybe you should be able to, to unmute yourself now and go ahead. We'll give it another go. Artin, you should have a pop-up on your screen just asking you if you wanna unmute and ask your question. Okay, we can come back to that in a second. Um, good uh, question here. What first interested you personally uh, in the world of archiving? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I started in photography specifically, so I did a BFA in fine art photography, and then I went down more the archival route. Um, I don't know what really shifted that. I guess just having a general 
his interest in history and um, you know long term preservation. I guess it might have to do with being Armenian also, like just having this desire to uh, preserve your family history and to make it accessible for future generations. Um, it's it's kind of an impulse that I have, I guess. Um, and photography was kind of my entryway into that, but now I'm working with a variety of different kinds of collections. But um, you know, my time at the MHSO was very precious and I, I learned a lot about um, digital collections, but also about different ethnocultural groups in Ontario and the Armenians in particular, they have a specific collection on the Armenian history there. Um, so I guess it's just a combination of, of all those things and uh, yeah. Great, uh, maybe we'll come back to the question we were on um, a couple minutes ago and I can see if, if I'm interpreting it right. If I'm not, please feel free to correct me, uh, question asker. So maybe we can um, just touch on, if you know, what do museums, the Canadian History Museum or other community organizations, what would make a archive valuable for them? Are there specific markers that people can think, oh, my family photos might be of value somewhere? Is there a process to go through? Yeah, so it, it depends again on the institution and their mandate. So. Um, you know, the MHSO, for example, they only collect things that are in, made or from Ontario. So if you came to them and said, I have, you know, my family history from Manitoba, they'll be like, well, we can't really take it. Like, it's very interesting, but we need to stick to our mandate. Um, because at the end of the day, we just don't have the space for the resources to store everything. So that's why mandates are created to help, uh, you know, specify this process. Um, and you know, once a donation is proposed, it has to go at the museum at least, it has to go through a committee and a whole process to ensure that it's um, something that we can afford to preserve and something that fits with our mandate. So there is a whole process behind it and it depends on the institution. Uh, some are more um, uh, strict than others, some are more lax. Um, but yeah, I would just do research on the institution look at what collections they already have, see what other donors they've had in the past and see if it's a good fit. And they might also be able to recommend other institutions like, because the goal of an institution is to help you um, preserve your material for long-term. So if they can't do it, they would rather you go somewhere else and help you that way. So they might be able to recommend. Um, it does help to have things, you know, properly somewhat organized and somewhat clean, like, most places probably won't want to take something that has like mold all over it or like water damage or, you know, it happens, unfortunately, but it just creates more work for the institution to be able to, you know, do the conservation work on those materials. So try to make sure they're clean and dry and in, in decent condition um, and just do some research on the institution to make sure it's a good fit. Awesome. And with that, we will wrap up this evening's session. Thank you all so much for attending um, and learning more about archival preservation and digital collection management with us. Thank you, of course, Cassandra, for such an engaging and a really, really practical session. Um, if you'd like to reach out, maybe we didn't get to your question or you think of something else, um, we'll, I'll also put Cassandra's email there in the chat box. Um, and if you'd like to revisit any portion of today's talk, maybe look at those five tips again, we have recorded the webinar and it will be live on the Zorin Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, the name there is ZIE Chronicles. We can also put that in the chat for you and it will be up soon, so look out for that. Um, and finally, to wrap up, I'd just like to remind you, you can check out the clips from the collection series also <laughs> on that YouTube channel, uh, especially as we approach April 24th, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day this weekend. Feel free to share that with your network. It's a really uh, great series. And for and more information on Zorian's other programs, you're welcome to visit zorianinstitute.org. Uh, and with that, I will bid you all a great evening. Thank you again, Cassandra, for joining us. Um, and take care, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your time. <laughs>